So my name is Mikhail Vransov. I'm a server software engineer at WhatsApp. Today I will talk about Varget, a globally distributed database we built at WhatsApp. But before we begin, I want to ask you, how many of you are using Mnija? Wow. I heard nobody uses it. <laughs> Bec because it's not uh, very good. <laughs> Except WhatsApp. Right. So, what is Forgets? Uh, Forgets is a measure replacement database uh, we, we built at uh, WhatsApp. It's built on top of our operational experience and it can be used for globally distributed setups. But uh, we don't use all uh, uh, features of Mnija, so we didn't implement all of them in uh, Forgets and we don't use features like transaction, for example. <sighs> Uh, as uh, we have just figured out, uh, not many of you are using uh, embedded databases. So a few words about embedded databases and what benefits they can bring. Uh, first of all, there is uh, no separate database here. Uh, many people think uh, not being responsible for the database is great because you outsource the responsibility. <coughs> But uh, on the other hand, it means that uh, you have to uh, communicate with database team. And what's wo even worse, uh, you will be limited by your conventional database uh, uh, interface and you may not be able to fully optimize your application because of these constraints. Uh, the next benefit of embedded database is uh, the same technology stack. Uh, so if you have uh, Erlang embedded database and Erlang application, it's very easy to debug your application. Uh, you can just run an instance of uh, your local database on your laptop and uh, do all, all the same operations which you do in productions. With conventional database, you either need to mock it or you need uh, to g have an instance of test database in production which is uh, less convenient, especially if you, say, work from home. Uh, the third benefit is predictable access time. So if your data is very close to your CPU, it's, uh, you know that, that you can access your data in microsecond uh, time range and uh, instead of network, uh, being one network hop away. Finally, uh, if you're using embedded database, you are free to combine uh, uh, several uh, types of tables with different persistent policies or different uh, replication policies uh, on the same node. And you can greatly benefit from it and you can create uh, quite performance setups. Uh, let's have a look at the example of uh, uh, such problem we have to deal at WhatsApp. Uh, if uh, you send a message to a user and uh, the recipient is offline at the moment, then we need to send a push notification to that user in order to wake up his phone, his phone will log in and uh, pull the messages. So uh, here sender sends uh, a message uh, via chat node to which it's connected. And for this slide, let's assume that we are using conventional databases. So. To send a push notification, first of all, you need a push token for that user. And you make a round trip to push tokens database. Then uh, you need to decide whether you want to send the message, uh, to send the push notification or not. Because you, if you just send a message to that user, you want to give uh, that user some time to receive push notification, to connect. You don't want uh, to send more and more push notifications to that user. So you need to space out. Uh, push notifications. Um, so this means that you need another round trip to recent push history database, which will tell you when we sent the last push notification to that guy. F finally, if we decided, yes, it's worth to send the push notification now, we need to make two more trips on the network. First of all, we need to update push recent push history database and when we need uh, to send a request to push gateway backend. Now, let's assume the same situation, but you, we use an embedded database. So, instead of making all these round trips, uh, 
we make just one cast to the push backend, which conveniently hosts both push token table and push history table. So we access uh, both items uh, locally. Uh, we make a decision based on that. And if decision is to send the push notification, we uh, send another cast to the push gateway backend. So the difference here is that uh, here we make just two one-way trips over the network. In previous example, it was six. And another difference is that chat node doesn't have to orchestrate uh, all this logic uh, anymore. And this means that we need less chat nodes, uh, where less uh, complex we can outsource this complexity. And finally, uh, there is one more caveat here. Push, his push history table has an update rate which is function of total message rate. And when your total message rate is over 65 billion messages a day, well, you, 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 ha you have to make uh, your solution scalable. Okay, uh, now let me uh, uh, tell you a little about how we use Mnija at WhatsApp before we are going to forget. Um, at WhatsApp, uh, uh, so all data is logically partitioned and split into islands. Uh, an island is a group of nodes which is responsible uh, for handling uh, data for uh, the same group of logical partitions. Uh, all requests for the given key is uh, are routed to the same node uh, under normal network state. So we have notion of uh, primary and failover nodes uh, for each uh, island. Code is always collocated with data and data is always stored in memory. This means that uh, you always access your data in predictable microsecond uh, time which is great. And finally, uh, we use uh, dirty rights only and uh, we don't use transactions. Uh, this is uh, okay because, uh, as I told you before, uh, only one node that, uh, can access the data uh, for that user at a given time. Now let's see how we route requests uh, and get back to islands and logical partitions. Um, so this is a simple example. Uh, we have a session backend. Uh, session backend maps a user to the chat node uh, process ID, uh, which serves this user. Uh, we need this mapping because it helps us uh, to route messages uh, for the user efficiently. So this is a very simplified example. Uh, session backend here has two islands. In each island, we have two nodes, and in total, we serve four partitions. In production, it's uh, much bigger. So uh, we have a client uh, logging into a chat node. We uh, need to register this client uh, in the session backend. How do we do this? First of all, we calculate a hash of uh, uh, the client phone number, modded by the number of partitions, and it gives us uh, uh, the logical partition to which uh, this user belongs to. When we query PG2 for the primary partition uh, for session backend serving partition free, and uh, it gives us uh, the PID of which is on certain node. And finally, we route uh, request to this uh, uh, node to this process ID. So this is the way how we ensure that uh, all requests for the given partition are routed uh, to the same node if uh, nothing in the network changes. So now let's have a few words about uh, potential uh, Mnesia problems. First of all, stock Mnesia doesn't support auto reconnection. And uh, networks are flaky. Uh, globally distributed databases are even flakier. Uh, so it's just a reality. Uh, Sometimes connection between two nodes uh, breaks. So you need to reconnect these nodes manually in the stock uh, Mnesia. Then uh, you reconnect them, but the problem is uh, both nodes may have gotten some updates uh, while they were disconnected. So both nodes are considered to be inconsistent and you need to reconcile them. Or maybe you don't, depends on your data. 
but there is no reconciliation uh, in the database, uh, in, uh, no reconciliation in Mija, so you need to write something on your own and to run it. And again, that's manual work and we want to avoid it. Finally, uh, Mnija is pretty sensitive to network slowdowns uh, because it pushes uh, updates for all, it pushes all updates uh, just directly over the dist to the remote node. There is no buffering in the middle. So if uh, one uh, connection uh, between two nodes becomes slow, it means that uh, back pressure will slowly propagate uh, towards your application and may effectively uh, uh, slow, slow down considerably or kill your node. And how these problems could be addressed? Uh, first of all, uh, we need to ensure that every sender uh, has to work just with one remote node. So one unhealthy uh, remote node uh, could not affect uh, connections to any other node. Secondly, we need to add uh, buffering to each sender, uh, which will uh, deal with uh, network slowdowns, with potential uh, network splits, and so on. Then, I think auto reconnection uh, is the absolutely must have tool which uh, saves you some time. And finally, you need some reconciliation tools, but we usually run them manually because there is always a risk that something may, may can go wrong. Okay, now you know literally everything how we run Mnija uh, at WhatsApp, and let's get back to Forget and its design decisions. Okay, so first of all, uh, Forgets has to be a drop in replacement for Mnija, and it should be as easy as possible to migrate from uh, Mnija to Forgets. Secondly, we still want, want our code collocation with data. We love it, uh, it's very efficient, and we keep it. Uh, next, we want to minimize uh, our manual operations. Uh, this is essentially a part of WhatsApp culture. We uh, are not uh, happy to run operations on our own. If something can be automated, we want to automate it, we will automate it, and we will write the code and, and new features after that. So, but uh, to support, uh, minim to minimize uh, manual operations, we need to be resilient to network issues and we need to support uh, automatic reconciliation. Otherwise, uh, we cannot achieve this goal. And the last, uh, but not the least, is the simplified schema management. Uh, it should be very easy to add a table, to remove a table, to add more nodes uh, to a cluster. Ability to uh, quickly add or remove table means that uh, your developers uh, can experiment with more types of data, they can separate uh, this data into multiple tables, they, when ca they can kill uh, the tables if they decided that it doesn't make sense for them. It uh, gives us uh, a lot of flexibility. But we don't claim that uh, Forgets is a generic database, it's not. It's influenced by uh, WhatsApp operational experience and uh, uh, it's uh, mostly for uh, in memory data, uh, in memory tables with optional persistence. And we have the following assumptions about uh, the usage of uh, forgets. So first of all, uh, for now we consider that all data fits in memory, which means that either all your data is frequently accessed or at least you can afford to store it. Maybe you don't have too much data. Uh, and so we are con currently considering to add uh, that support uh, to forget uh, to support cases when you have a lot of data but you don't uh, access it frequently. This will minimize the costs for such use cases. Secondly, uh, forgets doesn't make any strong consistency guarantees. It runs on eventual consistency and uh, we have chosen eventual consistency because we want to optimize the performance of our uh, system. Then again, we rely on the fact that uh, the system which uses forgets uh, routes requests for the given key to the same node uh, all over again. Uh, this is essential property which we want. Uh, let's have a few words about forgets islands uh, and how they are different from Mnija islands. First of all, you can use quite fancy configuration of soft islands uh, for example, I have used island of eight uh, for one particular use case. 
you can do this because uh, forgets uh, replication takes uh, less computational resources than uh, measure replication, mostly because of uh, update batching. But uh, you can adjust uh, batching parameters uh, and you can uh, get back to measure replication model if you want. And uh, your island uh, configuration is usually defined by the type of hardware you use and uh, the, the environment uh, you are in. So if you are running on the bare-bone hardware, like we did uh, in WhatsApp for the very long time, then you can use islands of two. Uh, why? Because uh, one node in your island uh, may have a bad uh, memory or bad CPU at one moment, but there is very, very small likelihood that uh, the second node uh, will uh, get the same problems when you are replacing uh, memory or hardware. So it's pretty safe to run Islands of Two on bare-bone hardware. If you are running in a virtual environment like AWS or Google Cloud, then there is one extra risk involved, which is your task may always get kicked out of your node at random moment. So it takes some time to restart your task on the new node, and there is a chance that uh, hardware on the second node may, may get fail, may fail in this window. That's why uh, we need islands of free to be safe in virtual environments. But everything changes if uh, your data is uh, truly globally replicated. In this case, and you can make uh, remote requ requests to your data. In this case, uh, there is no requirements of redundancy in every region uh, as long as you can tolerate uh, uh, the increased latency of uh, remote calls. But in our experience, uh, we don't play with islands of one uh, in a region. We usually use islands of two, islands of three. Okay. Uh, now let's see how forgets nodes communicate to each other. Uh, forgets uh, has a masterless design. Uh, which means that uh, any node in the island can write uh, an update for the given key at any time. Uh, this is discouraged, by, but this is possible. Uh, but uh, there is uh, absolutely no restrictions on writing various keys which belong to the same partition uh, at the same time. Uh, for this, we don't have any issues. So, uh, how it all works? Uh, your application worker uh, writes an update to the local ads table, then it sends uh, asynchronously uh, a request uh, to propagate this update to the remote node, and sender is responsible for this. It propagates this update to the receiver, and receiver reconciles this update with the local ads table. Similarly, uh, if node 2 wants to make an update, it works absolutely the same way. Let's have another look at uh, a single node architecture. When we uh, want to write something, uh, our worker writes an update to ads, then it asynchronously uh, propagates all these updates to senders, and it also, if your table is persistent, it uh, sends this update to dumper. Uh, dumper is responsible for writing uh, this update to the local transaction log, and senders, in the meantime, push these updates to the remote receivers, which reconcile these uh, updates with the local ads tables. Uh, reconciliation is uh, uh, one of uh, the central features of forgets. Uh, to make it work, we have uh, the following assumptions. Again, uh, first of all, all operations of a key happen in the same node in a stable network state. I'm repeating this for the third time, and this is the most important feature we expect. Secondly, NTP is running on your cluster, which uh, keeps the clock difference between your nodes uh, small. Uh, these uh, two first facts uh, allows us to use uh, microsecond precision timestamp uh, as a version for every record, because it mostly stays on the same node, and uh, even if it uh, failovers to another node, the clock difference is small and we can uh, work with it. And finally, uh, forgets uses uh, soft deletes, also known, known as tombstones, 
to replicate deletions to the remote nodes. Uh, let's see how we deal with uh, clock differences. Uh, first example is uh, leap second. So we write an, uh, an update for some record at timestamp equal to t, and then leap second happens. Uh, implementation can be different. Uh, in some cases, uh, just the timer slows down. In other cases, timer goes back. So we uh, have a look at the worst case here. So leap second happens, and the current time now is t minus one second. 100 milliseconds later, we have another update for the same key. Uh, we reconcile it with the local ads table, and we find out that uh, actually the time is going backwards here. Well, uh, we decided just to slip the difference uh, with 900 milliseconds. We can afford to do uh, this once in more than a year. And finally, we write uh, this record at timestamp, which does not go backwards. Very similar scenario is for the network fail uh, for the node failover case. Um, in the beginning, we get a remote replication uh, uh, for some record with timestamp equal to t, but this timestamp was captured at the remote node, and the local uh, time at this moment is t minus 300 milliseconds. Then uh, remote node uh, goes down and failover happens. At t minus 200 milliseconds, which is local time, we have local write. Yes, because failover happened. So we do the same thing. We sleep and we write the record with uh, the correct time. Okay. Forget record format. Uh, these are just simple tuples. Key, uh, last updated timestamp, and the value. There is also an optional TTL, and for tombstones, we don't use value. <sighs> now let's uh, take a look at various flavors of reconciliation. Uh, first of all, reconciliation on startup. Okay, when we start a node, first of all, we subscribe to live updates from all your peers. Uh, once we subscribe to them, we can request uh, a snapshot uh, from one of peers. Uh, from which peer we request the snapshot, it depends uh, on your configuration, but we usually prefer to query uh, local region uh, nodes, and we usually prefer to do some sort of round robin across all these nodes uh, to ensure that there are no spikes on some of peers. Finally, uh, ah, yeah. And uh, if your table is persistent, uh, we may need uh, to read uh, local. Uh, we may need to read local persistent files. Uh, but we only need to do this if your whole island uh, went down for some reason. Maybe you got DDoSed. Maybe uh, something else happened. So you still have all your data in persistent files, but you no longer have any random beams. This is the use case for persistent files. And uh, once you've done all of that, once snapshot from the peer was received, we consider this fragment of data reconciled. And once every fragment is reconciled, we consider forgets uh, is ready to serve the client traffic, and we enable the client traffic at that point. Um, persistent tables. Uh, Many people think it's the very important feature, but it's actually uh, the last resort feature because you need it only when all your nodes in the island went down. If you have at least one running node, you can reconcile from that node and restart all your peers. Another interesting fact about forgets is that the order in which persistent files are read is absolutely irrelevant as long as reconciliation function is uh, commutative. And the default forgets reconciliation function is uh, the latest timestamp bins is commutative. Uh, let me show one example of uh, 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 why it matters. So we start a node, we, we have empty forgets table. Uh, we read a transaction uh, log file. It has a record for the given key with timestamp equal to five. And because table is empty, uh, we write it uh, into forgets table. Then we read a snapshot. Snapshots are usually older, so it has also has a record for this key, but its timestamp is two, two less than five, so we don't uh, write a record from a snapshot into the table. 
finally, the node has started and we uh, get an update from the remote peer for the same key with timestamp equal to 8. 8 is greater than 5, so we write this update in the forget table. The important fact here is that regardless of in which order you received all these updates, you uh, will still end up in the correct state. The only important fact here is that you need to process all these updates in one thread. Otherwise, there may be some races. Okay, network splits. Always a problem with uh, Mnesia. Always have to do something manually. How far guess deal with, deals with it? Uh, in the beginning, we, uh, we write an update for the record on node 1. It's propagated to node 2. When network split happens. When we have some updates on both nodes, they are not propagated to the peer. And finally, uh, network uh, joins again. We can detect it by a node up event, maybe some, some other way. Uh, so at this point, we need to figure out uh, how much data we need to reconcile in every direction. Of course, you can reconcile your whole uh, table uh, to the other side. It, it works uh, because uh, of uh, forgets uh, commutative uh, reconciliation function. But uh, you don't want to reconcile all the data. It's a waste of traffic and resources. Uh, here it's pretty obvious. Uh, we need to reconcile time range from T1 to T4 on node 1 and from T2 to T4 on node 2. Uh, how do we do this? Um, if this network split was uh, pretty short, it's very easy. All these updates will be buffered in the sender buffer tables, and we just push these updates. We push automatically. So there is nothing to do for us. If network split was long enough, then potentially some of uh, sender buffer tables overflown and got empty. And now we don't know we don't have these updates and we don't know what to reconcile. So when we empty the table uh, on the sender, we must remember the minimum timestamp in the table. And on network join, we just have to crawl our table and copy records from the given timestamp onwards. Uh, the next problem we are dealing with are network slowdowns or outages. So in the normal state, worker uh, sends the update to sender. Sender writes it to its local uh, ads buffer table. And then on uh, gen server uh, timeout, uh, sender fetches some of these updates and pushes them to the receiver. Uh, we made a conscious decision uh, to favor incoming messages to the sender over uh, emptying the buffer uh, because it keeps sender incoming queue empty and uh, it's good for garbage collector and it's good for performance. Uh, so receiver uh, reconciles these updates with the local ads table and then uh, sends acknowledgement back to sender uh, that these updates were applied. At this point, uh, sender can erase all these updates from the buffer table. Now let's see what happens if network uh, throughput, uh, if network slows down and its throughput uh, decreases. Uh, in this case, sender potentially will not be able to uh, keep up with uh, incoming rate of updates, so its buffer table will start growing but its size has to be bound by number of records or by the percentage of uh, node memory. For now, let's assume that everything went successfully and uh, network has recovered and uh, at this case, uh, sender will eventually drain its uh, buffer table and uh, everything will get to the normal state. Now let's assume another worst case. Uh, for some reason, sender is unable to send uh, messages to the remote node, so its buffer table overflows, and it's at, at some point at the threshold it will get emptied, and sender will mark itself as not eligible for updates locally. Um, in this case, we have two, uh, two possible scenarios. One scenario is uh, node 2 was killed. Cleaner lady just pulled the, the, the cord from the machine. Well, it happens. Uh, or in our case, uh, we have uh, network split. Uh, 
in this case again we don't know if remote net if remote node is with us or it went down so we keep buffering updates until uh, as long as we can but uh, these two cases converge uh, to the same state uh, to the same normal state again so if uh, we had the network split uh, as i told you before we will reconnect and we will reconcile uh, the whole window of network split if node 2 died uh, and was restarted later it will request uh, all all the data from the remote from node 1 here and they converge uh, to the same normal state again uh, the final feature of uh, forgets i want to talk about are is soft deletes also known as tombstones uh, so tombstone is written uh, to the ads table when we delete a record. Uh, it's used for replication of delete operations and we decided to clean it up periodically. I will get back to all these uh, points in following slides. Uh, first of all, uh, let's take a look at uh, the situation which proves that we need uh, tombstones. Uh, at this beginning, two nodes have uh, the same record when network split happens. And on node one, we delete this record. In this slide, we uh, let's suppose that tombstones uh, do not exist. So uh, there is no record anymore on node one, there is still a record on node two. Network joins, and as I told you before, we reconcile all operations which happened uh, between network split and network join, but in this case, uh, nothing has happened on node 1 because there is no trace of uh, key equal to 1. So we end up in the inconsistent data state. We have record on node 2, we don't have record on node 1, which is uh, very, very bad. Uh, now let's see what uh, changes when we add tombstones. Same situation, but uh, now we write a tombstone uh, to the table for that key. Network joins and uh, we are reconciling the difference again. And in this case, we reconcile the tombstones to node 2. So we have correct uh, state of data on both nodes and it's, it's consistent. Uh, the second problem here is uh, uh, why we need tombstones and uh, when we clean them up. Uh, in the ideal world, if uh, all our nodes are always running and always healthy, we potentially don't need tombstones because we always propagate all our changes and with shared changes always get delivered to remote nodes. But in reality, there is speed of light, there are routers, there are any possible network issues. So you never know the current state of remote node at the given time. You, always, uh, you only know the state of remote node in the past. That's why we need tombstones. Uh, now let's see how we can clean them up. Uh, the most straightforward uh, solution to this problem is count the uh, number of nodes to which we, we have delivered a snapshot. Uh, it works pretty well. Uh, we can use adds update counter. Uh, but uh, and we delete the record when counter reaches zero. Uh, the pros of this approach is that your tombstones will get deleted nearly immediately, so there is uh, less memory pressure, your ads operations are running slightly faster. Uh, but the cons is uh, if you have many peers, you, you will have to do a lot of ads uh, updates for that uh, tombstone, which, uh, which kills all the performance benefits uh, of this approach. Uh, so we decided to go another way. We clean up tombstones <laughs> periodically. When it's time to do the cleanup, uh, we query all peers <coughs> if they are up and healthy. And by healthy, I, I mean that uh, all tables uh, are in the ready state and uh, there are no backlogs uh, in forgets. And if all peers uh, report themselves as healthy, when we clean up all tombstones until the moment when we send this request minus maximum uh, time jitter in your cluster minus maximum round trip time in your cluster. Uh, I don't want uh, to measure these guys, uh, so I just add 
some constant which is surely over uh, these two variables, say 15 seconds. And uh, I clean up all data until the health check time minus 15 seconds. It works pretty well. Okay, let's summarize. Why we think that Vargets uh, is better than Amnesia in our use case? First of all, Vargets uh, provides us better tolerance to network problems, uh, which means that your nodes uh, are down for uh, a small amount of time, you get less alerts, uh, your developers uh, are less grumpy, especially at night. Um, uh, second uh, is the tiny operation overhead. If your system is able to recover on its own, you don't spend time on it. Uh, the most you do is uh, reconfiguring the system, which is done pretty infrequently. Then, ability to easily add or remove tables, as I told you before, allows us uh, to do a lot of experiments uh, at a very low cost uh, and store this data in production along with our real production data. And it sped, sped up our development time quite a lot. And finally, region-aware reconciliation, it helps us uh, to recover faster uh, after outage because uh, we know that we can pull data from local region faster, we know at what speed we can pull data from our neighbor regions, and we use this information when we make decisions how to reconcile. Okay, so before I finish, uh, one small announcement. WhatsApp is hiring, we are hiring in the United States, we are hiring in Europe, we are looking for Erlang uh, experienced developers, and we are looking for C plus network uh, plus Linux developers. If you are interested, talk to me uh, directly. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Now I'm ready for questions.